Howdy folks, this is Jimmy Aiken, and I wanted to let you know about a special offer. When you become a patron of the Cordial Catholic Podcast at $8 or more a month, Keith will send you a copy of my new book, The Bible is a Catholic Book. To become a patron, just go to patreon.com slash cordial catholic. Hi, hey, welcome to the Cordial Catholic, a podcast for non-Catholics, new Catholics, and those looking to dig deeper into the Catholic faith. I'm K. Albert Little. I'm an evangelical, non-denominational convert to Catholicism, and this podcast is born out of one particular idea. You see, as a non-Catholic Christian looking into the roots of my faith, I began to realize that what I thought the Catholic Church taught, what I believed, was often completely wrong. It was based on misunderstandings, misinformation, and rumors. In fact, the Catholics around me had no idea what they believed either. It seemed like no one knew what was going on. Well, this podcast is meant to fill in that gap. The gap between what we think we know Catholics believe and what Catholics actually do believe. That gap is enormous sometimes. Well, that's my goal. No misinformation here. We have real Catholic conversations with real Catholic thinkers from the heart of the Catholic Church. And my guest today is a phenomenal one. I am joined by apologist, author, and host of the Classical Theism podcast, John DeRosa. John works every week to have fantastic discussions with philosophers, theologians, historians, apologists to help Catholics understand and defend things from the existence to God, the Lordship of Christ, and the founding of the Catholic Church. He takes deep, deep dives into these subjects and comes up with fantastic information. He's my guest, and we tackle atheist objections to Catholicism. John spent a long time digging into these subjects with a number of guests and on his own in his own studies as well, and he brings us all of that information, synthesized and delivered to us. He tackles some of the most challenging atheist objections with such clarity and logic and grace. It's a phenomenal interview. This podcast is brought to you in part by my patrons, If you want to help support the show with even $1 or $2 a month, less than a cup of coffee every month, go to patreon.com slash cordialcatholic. Your support, your donations, your prayers and fasting as well help keep this show going. Your financial support helps it to be sustainable and keep running. I appreciate all of that support. It's at patreon.com slash cordialcatholic. Now, without any further ado, here is my fantastic conversation with John DeRosa. Please listen and enjoy. Hi, friends, and welcome back to The Cordial Catholic. My guest this week is a phenomenal one, and I am so excited that he can join us. It's John DeRosa. John is a writer, a speaker, and the host of the Classical Theism podcast, one of my absolute favorite podcasts. They deep dive into philosophy, theology, historical apologetics, and defend three pillars of the Catholic Christian worldview that the God of classical theism exists, that Jesus is our Lord and Messiah, and that he founded the Catholic Church. John talks every week with a range of fantastic guests and does absolutely incredible deep dives into these incredible subjects. I am so glad to have John on the podcast, this podcast, this week with me for a fantastic discussion. John, thank you for being here, and welcome to The Cordial Catholic. Thanks, Keith, so much. It's great to join you. I've been binge listening to the Cordial Catholic Podcast, and I'm excited to be on the show. 
<laughs> well, thank you. I, I often, uh, you know, when I first found your podcast, I binge listened to the thing though for a number of days. It's it's fantastic, and and like I said, I love how you could do these really deep dives in some of my favorite uh, topics, like f- philosophy, theology, and and the Catholic Church. So I wonder if you can start by talking to us about your own faith journey and how you got involved with apologetics and podcasting in the first place. Sure. Yeah. So I, some people might've heard my story before if they listen to my show, but for those who haven't, I'm a cradle Catholic. Uh, you know, I went to church growing up. I had what I describe as like a fideistic faith where, you know, I prayed, but I didn't really look into things intellectually. I did think I had what I would call, you know, some religious experience. I was confirmed, you know, in the Catholic church and my parents always backed me up in, in ways of the faith, you know, when bad things would happen, um, and then they would end up okay. I would always hear my dad. He would say to me, "You know, John, God was with you today." And that just always kind of reaffirmed me in my in my faith. Um, I remember seeing him praying. My dad would pray the rosary. He would give me blessings. So we did. We were a Catholic family, but yet I was never exposed to the intellectual side of the faith or apologetics growing up. Then in college, as I'm sure this happens to a lot of people, you know, I went to a secular university, the College of New Jersey, and very quickly I was faced with. Uh, intellectual objections to the faith. Um, Actually, my first year as a freshman on campus at TCNJ, a famous atheist, Christopher Hitchens, came to debate Christian apologist Frank Turek on our college campus. There were like people protesting, there were people excited for the atheist side, the Christian side. I didn't know how to place it in my mind. I just, I'd never been aware of apologetics. Uh, I didn't know what was going on really fully. I listened to a bit of it and I ended up walking out halfway through the debate and went to a Catholic campus ministry event. And just, and I'll kind of tie this up quickly, but eventually I found out that our Catholic campus ministry had a weekly group about apologetics and it was run by our priest, Father Bill. And so I found out what that was. I didn't know what it was at first. You know, what is apologetics? What are you apologizing for the faith? And then I went to the weekly meetings and their textbook, everybody got a free copy of a handbook of Catholic apologetics by Dr. Peter Kreeft and (laughs) Father Ronald Ticelli. And I still remember picking it up for the first time uh, in a friend's house. And I was like astonished. I opened up the resurrection. I couldn't believe that no one ever told me this stuff existed. So that's just a brief story. I went through a bunch of up and downs. I had beliefs. I had doubts. You know, at times I was like, oh, man, should I still be Catholic? Should I look into these other Christian faiths? But a few years after college, I found myself still Catholic, feeling pulled to remain in the Catholic Church and just wanting to learn more about how to explain and defend the faith. And I really am indebted to our priest, Father Bill, who taught us that intellectual side as well as the pastoral side. So that's where my interest in apologetics came. And, you know, I consider it a blessing because I'm, I'm still interested in it and it never really left. And then from there, I got into Catholic podcasts. You know, I used to love listening to Catholic Answers and other podcasts out there. And I was like, hey, maybe I could start my own, learn alongside some of the great experts. And then I found your podcast. I found others. And it's just really a cool time to – there's no excuse now. Like maybe 20, 30 years ago, you had to go buy books if you wanted to learn this stuff. Now – there's so much of it out there for free. So we as Catholics, we can't have the excuse of just having a dumbed down faith. You know, Bishop Barron kind of chastises us in a way, in a good way of saying, like, you can't just have a dumbed down Catholicism. In this day and age, there's so much out there for free, so many podcasts, so many uh, apologetic sources. I, I know I'm into this, you're into this, but we want to kind of amp up the rigor, the intellectual rigor, and show that the Catholic Christian worldview is true. Yeah, and I got to say that you are doing such a good job on the very cutting edge of that. You know, even you know, your podcast is is phenomenal for bringing that to people and that rigorous uh, look into those topics. And your website is fantastic too. And even the, the books you're producing, based on some of those your studies and those those interviews and discussions you have, are phenomenal as well. I mean, you have a great email list. I'm, I'm getting emails all the time from you with little updates and and other little tidbits and and helpful things to think about and reflect on and you know you are absolutely uh phenomenal at equipping our fellow catholics to defend the faith and and like you say there really is uh no excuse these days when there are just so many resources available i love how you put that yeah well thank you i appreciate it. you're very kind keith with the uh words and i i love it because 
I'm, I consider myself, and I'm sure you would wear this label as well. I say at our podcast, we're studious amateurs. We're interested in studying. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be a super philosopher, but just have an interest. Start somewhere, and then we're going to come alongside some of the great guests that you've had on your show. I've had on my show as well, and we're just going to keep learning so that when we get into conversations about the faith, we'll have something substantial to say. Yeah, absolutely. And I do love that studious amateur term. That uh, That's a fantastic definition, and I definitely subscribe to that camp too. All right, so I'd like to know specifically what got you interested in writing a book uh, answering atheist slogans, which is what we're looking at today, and, I, and, and what your approach is to speaking to people in general about the existence of God and answering some of these slogans. Do you have a particular approach that kind of frames the way you even begin to talk to people about faith? You know, it's a great question, and I, I thank you for asking that. I do have approach an approach that was formed and kind of stolen and borrowed from you know other great people that I hear defending the faith. The main person being Trent Horn, uh, but also a lot of other apologists and priests that I've learned from over the years. But the 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 basic approach centers around asking questions rather than making statements. And, you know, I'll talk about the slogans in a second. Why don't I just mention answering atheist slogans came about because I just saw people like slinging these one liners, whether on the Internet or in conversation, like, oh, you know, the religion is so stupid. It's just a crutch that people have to get them through, you know, the tough issues of life. Or, come on, how could you be religious when there's people dying in a children's hospital? Or, yeah, you know, faith, that's for people who believe in Santa Claus clause and other things. And all of these kind of like one-liner things that if you don't think about the faith a lot, like myself growing up, if I had heard these in middle school and high school, I probably wouldn't have known, you know, good answers to them or how to respond. So I wanted to develop a little resource that would show people exactly how to respond to these. So that was that's the genesis of answering atheist slogans. And then my particular approach, you know, I get it for people like Trent Horn, Brandon Vaught, and others, centers around the idea of asking questions rather than making statements. And questions are so great because they can open people up to, it opens you up to how they're thinking and learning more about them and, you know, treating them as a treasure who they're people too and they deserve to be listened to, even if they did sling a slogan. And I, I just want to tell one quick story. Recently, when I was on a hike this summer with my wife, uh, somewhere around the Delaware Water Gap, we were approaching um, where we were going to hike and there was a tent set up with the Jehovah's Witnesses and they were ready to like witness to people. And I was like kind of excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so interesting. <laughs> I'm going to get to talk to them about the faith. And the first thing my wife said to me, she's like, oh, well, you know, she was kind of sighing. She's like, just don't talk down to them. Don't, you know, don't make it seem like you're better than them. And I was like, oh my gosh, how bad of a, um, you know, picture do we apologists make for ourselves when we come across as, you know, arrogant, talking down to people, you know, just like shouting the truth in their face. And that's what came to mind when she heard I was going to talk to these uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. So I would say my approach, the approach that I like from other people is don't start by just, you know, responding forcefully with loud argumentation, but rather take a step back. You want to ask people questions and treat them as treasures. And that word I got from Dr. Josh Rasmussen, who I had on the show. And he pointed out if your apologetic approach fails to treat the other person as a treasure made in the image of God, then even if the argument succeeds, the approach like nullifies the efforts because, okay, you made a good argument, but you're not treating them as the argument that says God exists says that you should be treating them. So it kind of undercuts itself when we fail to treat people that way. So my main approach is ask questions rather than make statements. I'll give a lot of examples of that as we talk about these things. The person to listen to on this is Trent Horn. You got to listen to his podcast. Listen to him on Catholic Answers because he'll give you a lot of questions you can ask. A couple other tips I give to people in the introduction is you got to pray every day. Um, even if it's a short time, set apart that time where you can, you know, you need God's grace to cultivate in your life. Because when you enter into conversations with unbelievers and skeptics, it can get really tough and it can get sad, it can get upsetting, and it can get difficult at times. And if you don't stay close to God in prayer, you're going to want to give up, even after like one or two conversations. And then the, the last little tip I'll share Apologetics, I found, I got this tip from Dave Van Vickle, and he said that apologetics is most helpful to those who are already open 
to the faith. So you can't expect to convert people in one conversation. All right. You're not going to change a hardened skeptic's mind in one conversation. Typically, people have to be moved from a position of like, I could never, ever believe this. Maybe they start there. And then they need to first move to like, eh, maybe I could believe this, but I need to see more evidence. Once they're moved into that position where they're more open, which is usually not a first conversation, but later on, and you may not even be the person to do it, that's when uh, the apologetic evidence and arguments could be more helpful. But those would be some preliminary points. And then the main one centering around the whole book is ask questions rather than make statements. Oh, yeah. Those are great things to underscore. I definitely appreciate that uh, perspective that uh, I've heard Trent share as well, uh, probably on your show, actually. But I, I love that asking the asking questions approach. And, and and looking at the people you're talking to as treasures, that's a fantastic point to underscore. You know, how often do we, does it become about winning the argument or proving your point? Meanwhile, the, the, the whole point is that the, treat that person as a treasure of, of God, a child of God, to hopefully show them how much God loves them, right? And so if it's just about yes. winning the argument, we, you totally lose the narrative, you lose the point entirely. And that's something I've, and we continue to grow in year after year. But when I first got interested in apologetics, I will say I was attracted to that aspect of like trying to win the argument. But over time, I've realized that's secondary to, you know, winning the person. And as Pat Flynn likes to say, you had him on a few shows ago, apologetics is not about winning arguments. You know, it's about winning souls for Jesus Christ. So that's what you want to keep in the back of your mind. You don't want to shove people away with your tone or your arrogance. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I call this this podcast the cordial Catholic, and I often joke with that I'm working, I'm working towards the, that title. I don't, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I like it. No, absolutely. And we're all working towards that title. And, and you know what? The more cordial you come across, maybe you got to bite your tongue in some instances. Maybe you even think you have a really good argument, but uh, at that time, you're not going to deliver it. And that's where I say, if you don't pray every day, it's going to be tough to discern you know, when to make those decisions in conversation or maybe someone you could reach out to. That's where prayer can, can really make a difference is I'll find, you know, sometimes maybe if I prayed that morning versus when I've skipped prayer or something like that, that I might be moved, you know, with the courage to like ask someone something like, hey, how are you doing today? Uh, you know, you look like you're a little bit down and that might lead to a conversation about the faith and those small movements in life can start in prayer. So I know we're going to get into apologetics, but yeah, all that tone, cordial, respectful, treasure type stuff. Don't neglect that as an apologist. The best apologists take that stuff seriously as well as the evidence and arguments. Yeah, that's so well put. All right. So I want to start here and, you know, I have a number of, of, surprisingly sometimes to me, but number of loyal atheist or agnostic or materialist naturalist listeners to this podcast, and it does surprise me sometimes, but uh, we're going to talk about how to meet some of these these slogans. And But I want to start with asking you the question, we talk about proofs or proving God's existence, especially when talking with atheists or non-believers, but what do we mean when we say proofs or proving God's existence? Yeah, it's a good question, and probably one that's often misunderstood by both Catholics as well as atheists, but let me give it a shot here. Uh, the important magisterial statement on this topic comes from the First Vatican Council, and they actually condemned the idea that God cannot be known with certainty by the natural light of human reason. And by condemning that idea, they're showing that it's at least possible that by the natural light of human reason, without divine revelation, someone can attain knowledge that God exists. Now, that doesn't mean everyone's going to be able to do that. It doesn't mean everyone's going to know the intricacy of each and every proof. But the Catholic Church holds that it is indeed possible to prove God's existence. Now, what do we mean by proof here? And I will say there's been a ton of arguments proposed throughout you know, the centuries and the millennia, and some of the arguments are more proofy than others. But in general, proof means a deductive demonstration. You know, it's a proof where the premises follow necessarily and the arguments are tight. And when the word proof is used, people are often like allergic to that idea because they're like, oh, wait, aren't we just supposed to know it by faith? But it turns out that knowing something by reason and knowing it by faith are not mutually exclusive. 
And St. Thomas Aquinas talks about how trusting revelation to attain truth, you know, that's going to be the more natural mode for many people who don't have the leisure or the time or the, you know, specialization to consider all the arguments from natural theology. You know, maybe they would get there, but they'd have very general knowledge of God. Maybe they'd have a lot of mistakes in there. Uh, But in general, a proof is a deductive demonstration. The church says it is absolutely possible to prove God's existence, but not everyone's going to be able to do it. And then within, underneath that level of proof, I would say there's deductive demonstrations. That's like the top level, you could say. There's also a lot of other evidence for God's existence that doesn't have that tight deductive metaphysical necessity, but it still counts as pointing in the direction that God exists. C.S. Lewis, and I think Brandon Vaught uses this in his new book too, is used the phrase of signposts. So there's other arguments that are kind of pointers or evidence towards God, even if they don't carry that full label of proof. So what am I talking about here? Well, the deductive metaphysical proofs, those are things like Aquinas's five ways Leibniz has a contingency argument. Edward Fazer recently has a book, Five Proofs of the Existence of God. Bernard Lonergan and Robert Spitzer, Father Robert Spitzer, they have their own renditions of arguments for an unconditioned reality and an unrestricted act of understanding. I mentioned Dr. Josh Rasmussen. He has a nice book out this year on how reason can lead to God. And these arguments, those are the metaphysical kind. They're the ones that are more considered like proof, and they're typically broken down into stage one and stage two. In stage one of that type of argument, you would arrive at the existence of some reality that's different from our present experience, though we start the reasoning with our present experience. So you might arrive at like an unmoved mover, maybe you've heard that term, or purely actual reality, or absolutely necessary being, or unconditioned reality. So the first stage of those proofs is to get to something that can be described with those terms. And then stage two unpacks the attributes of Uh, of that thing, which was arrived at in stage one, and it shows why we ought to say God exists. So stage two, it might show that the being has to be eternal, immutable, simple, and possess that which is analogous to intellect and will. And we could talk more about those details later if you want. Personally, I really like Dr. Robert A. Delfino's presentation of the third way of St. Thomas Aquinas from possible and necessary beings. I heard you had him on your show earlier. He does a nice job presenting the third way when he was on my show. I think you guys talked about the fifth way But all of those are what I would say metaphysical demonstrations, deductive demonstrations that purport to show with the the certainty of metaphysics that God does exist. And I could talk more about that if you want. But let me just tell you a few other things that are out there. So say you're like, okay, I get those are like the, you know, those are the top level of strongest, quote unquote, proof for God. But there's a lot of other good evidence and arguments. So people might be familiar with Dr. William Lane Craig, who I think gives great arguments to show that God is the best explanation of various things, things like the beginning of the universe, that's like the Kalam cosmological argument, as well as the fine tuning of the universe for life, that would be the design argument. He also defends a moral argument as well. And then just to list off a few other things, there's C.S. Lewis's famous argument from reason, showing that naturalism cannot be rationally affirmed. That's what he sets out to do. There's other arguments from miracles, because if you can show that a miracle occurred, that would be evidence of the supernatural. There's C.S. Lewis's argument from desire. I still remember doing that one in college. It was in the textbook uh, by Kreeft and Ticelli, the argument from desire. And then there's uh, Dr. Rhoda's updated version of Pascal's wager. I'm basically just giving a hop, skip, and a jump through different guests and arguments that we've considered on my podcast. In, a, in the past, but I would say there's ex, there's many evidence for God that we might present to someone in conversation. Depends on the context and the person, uh, context and the purpose of your conversation. Uh, but when you use the word proof, I think that's most naturally referring to the metaphysical demonstrations, which are like Aquinas's five ways and those things I said earlier. Yeah, that's a fantastic amount of resources there. No, I really appreciate that, you know. And and the one thing that that really underscores for me is, I mean, the seriousness. You have characters like Dawkins who kind of waves his hand and dismisses all, uh, you know, thousands of years of philosophy in one in in a short work he he's written. You know, but but what you just presented there, you know, quite succinctly, just shows the amount of rigor and thought that has gone into and goes into uh, talking about God's existence. This is not some um, like sideline uh, activity of philosophy or some kind of low level thing going on with the with uh, maybe a, you know Christian apologists in a basement somewhere. This is this is serious study, uh, an area of serious study, right? <laughs> 
Absolutely. No, and I, I would just want to add to that because I think sometimes people just need to be exposed to the fact that this thing exists. Because oh, I'll give you another case in point. Recently, I had Dr. Robert Coons on the podcast. He's teaching a graduate seminar on arguments for God's existence this fall, 2019. And, you know, how many people out there would even know such a thing exists, that there's people at the graduate level seriously studying these proofs for God's existence, and he's showing why some of them actually succeed and they work. And I think, you know, the regular person in the pew who gets confronted by a new atheist or someone who's very confident because they looked up some objections to Jesus and so forth, and they're just like, you know, chomping at the bit to deconvert someone. If someone in the pew hasn't heard Heard about this stuff, uh, they would just be excited to know that it's out there. So I think step one, sometimes of our apologetics, is just letting people know that hey, these arguments are out there, and when you're ready to do some homework to dive into it, check them out because there's a lot of great reasons to believe in God. <laughs> well said. All right, so let's begin with one of the most popular rebuttals to God's existence, and I think maybe one of the most difficult to challenge because the premise is so often held by people without their even realizing it. I think. And it's the idea that science has proven that God doesn't exist or that God isn't necessary. How do you respond to the challenge, I don't believe in God, I believe in science? Yeah, this is a common one. I even, like, one of my friends uh, said this to me, one of my childhood friends, you know, he grew up Catholic, Catholic, but then he's like, you know, I, I would want to be religious, but I just love science too much. People set up this dichotomy between believing in God and believing in science, but I actually don't think it's too difficult to answer this charge if you just do a little bit of homework. The key is you need to ask that person this question. Here it is, and I'll say it twice. What precisely is the incompatibility you see between believing in God and believing in science? All right, so the next time someone actually asserts to you, you know, how could you believe in God with all this scientific aid, uh, all the scientific discoveries, or, you know, science has disproved God, or things like that, you need to ask them for specifics. And this is where, you know, Trent's questioning technique comes in, because until you know what exactly they're thinking, you could just go off on some rabbit trail about science and given all these facts when that's not even their argument. So you ask that person, what precisely is the incompatibility you see between believing in God and believing in science? Because as a Catholic, I believe in both. And then the ball's in their court. And you could honestly just let them talk and hear what they have to say. I wrote down in my little ebook, I have like four of the most common answers, the popular answers. Oh, actually, what do you think they're going to say, Keith? Because you've had these conversations with people. What do you think is a common rebuttal for what precisely is the incompatibility? Well, you know what? And I think that statistics and uh, studies and whatnot bear this out. But what I see and have seen, you know, because I came from a strand of non-denominational evangelical Christianity before I became Catholic. And... <sighs> A lot of uh, people in that circle would have come from a place where the Bible must be read literally, and as soon as that literal view of the Bible is challenged by science, you know, you 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 literally can't fit those two things together in a lot of cases. So suddenly, if if my worldview, which contains a literal interpretation of the Bible, can't be fit with science uh, based on a seven day creation cycle then suddenly, well, science science is real. We can see and prove and use science, so the Bible must not be. And so we reject God, we reject the Bible based on how we read the Bible. That's one of the most common things that I've encountered. I think that's actually the number one thing. That's actually the number one thing I have on my list is issues related to creation and evolution and how six-day creation in the Bible contradicts modern biology. That's probably one of the number one answers you're going to get from folks, so I'm glad you brought that up. But guess what? As Catholics, we are permitted to affirm both the truth of the Bible and the truth of evolution. And so that's where you can get into the idea that the genre of a text is very important. And we do affirm that God created the world. We do affirm that he created uh, our first parents, two, uh, two human beings. He infused into them a rational soul for the first time, Adam and Eve. But apart from that, the details of Genesis the Catechism says that they contain figurative language, and Catholics, although they're permitted to believe in a six-day creation, they're also permitted to go along with an evolutionary paradigm where God guided his creation from the moment up until humans were created. And there's a great resource, it's Thomistic Evolution, where a bunch of priests who are also Thomists and contributors and knowledgeable of science and biology, 
write about this reconciliation. So really, as Catholics, we don't see a conflict. It's perfectly possible that God created through evolution. And so that's not really an incompatibility. And then put the question back to them again. Is there another incompatibility you take issue with? Or what do you want to know further? Because that issue can be resolved on the Catholic worldview. And then I can give two other quick ones if you want. Yeah, I'd love to hear them because I suppose if the person challenging you isn't necessarily a Christian or a Catholic, they might have no real... uh, they might not, might not see any kind of problem with the, with the Bible being compatible with science. They might just see science as being as making God unnecessary, right? Yeah. So that that kind of gets into the the two other things I'll mention are uh, miracles being science would say miracles are impossible. Or I think the one you're mentioning is uh, that science is the only way of knowing. And we don't find out any evidence of God through science. You know, there's no scientific evidence for God. Therefore, there's no reason to affirm that God exists. So those are two popular ones. And just briefly, the one that you're getting at where, you know, or maybe you have something different in mind. When you say science makes God unnecessary, maybe you can clarify that in a second. But the two I address in my ebook are, well, first of all, yes, science, um, science doesn't say that miracles are impossible. It's just when we operate on the scientific method, you know, you're using observation and you're just working with the tools of science, but you can't say that miracles are impossible because if God exists, then God can do a miracle. And if you don't agree with that, well, then I would like to talk more about that because we're not talking about the same definition of God. You know, we can agree that scientists can proceed sometimes along the lines that's mentioned as methodological naturalism. Like as they're proceeding in their experiments, they're assuming that things are operating according to the natural course and that miracles are not occurring. But that doesn't show that miracles are impossible because if God exists, then Rarely, you know, once in a while, as a great revelatory act, he can perform a miracle. We think we have good evidence for some of those, like the resurrection and others. But I would say science that can't show that miracles aren't are impossible. Rather, it just assumes or proceeds along lines of the fact that they're not occurring. But that doesn't mean that they don't exist. And that gets into the other uh, example that. And you could tell me if you're thinking of something different, but usually what people say is there's no scientific evidence for God or science is the only way of knowing and science doesn't show us evidence for God. And this is a view we could coin as scientism, where you're saying that science is the only way of knowing stuff and science doesn't show there's only evidence for God. But what we just have to do is question that scientism. We would deny that assumption that science is the only way of knowing. And the way you do that is just to ask that person another question. How do you know that science is the only way of knowing? Or how did you come to that conclusion? And whatever answer they give to that, it's not going to be a set of scientific experiments like, oh, I mixed these chemicals together and out popped the prep, uh, proposition that science is the only way of knowing. <laughs> That's not how it works. You know, the, what they're going to give you is some philosophical reasoning, because saying that science is the only way of knowing is a philosophical position. And because it's a philosophical position, it's not a scientific conclusion. So if science is the only way of knowing then the proposition, science is the only way of knowing, is not a form of real knowledge because it wasn't arrived at using science. So either philosophy can work to provide us with good evidence, not just scientific reasoning, or science is not the only way uh, of knowing. So oh, and another way to refute that as well, that scientism, is you could just point to other ways that we know things. So some common ones, you know, we know truths about ethics. Things about right and wrong. You talk about really obvious ones. We know truths about logic and mathematics that are not dependent on science. We also know truths of history. Um, We can look back and say what probably happened in the past, and that's not the same as doing a physics, chemistry, or biological experiment. So what I would say is just because there's no scientific evidence for God, I would actually challenge that. I think there are there, there there's scientific evidence that supports premises in arguments for God's existence. But what this person has in mind is like seeing God in a laboratory or going up into space and the Russian cosmonaut saying, oh, I don't see a heaven up here. I don't see God up here. There must not be a God. That, that crude understanding is not true because even if there's no scientific evidence for God in that sense, it wouldn't imply that God doesn't exist. And the classic um, illustration that Dr. Edward Fazer uses is think of science as like a metal detector and you're going to the beach with a metal detector and you're trying to find plastic cups – 
Well, just because you can't find plastic cups or plastic specimens on the beach with a metal detector doesn't mean that plastic cups don't exist. The metal detector is just the wrong tool. So just because you can't find scientific evidence for God in a laboratory, you know, mixing chemicals together and whatnot, zooming in under a microscope, zooming out under a a telescope, just because you can't find God in that way doesn't mean he doesn't exist. Those are just the wrong tools for leading to the existence of God. And the right tools are philosophy, good reasoning, and things I mentioned previously. Yeah, that's so that's so well put. I, those are great, fantastic examples. And, you know, I guess what I was getting at was just, you know, that idea that, you know, we don't need God because science answers everything. But th- then, you know, you've given us some tools to, uh, I think, quite succinctly push back against that kind of a uh, an atheist objection, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think you just got to ask that person. Well, first of all, we would question that, that that science can explain everything because science can't explain itself and the own workings of science without, you know, appealing to other things that are beyond science, namely good philosophy and other things we could get into. But I think just asking the person to spell out the incompatibility is the biggest thing to take away on this objection. Don't let them get away with just saying there's a contradiction between science and God. Just ask them to explain it. And if they come up with something that you've never heard before and you're like, oh, that's an interesting point. I have no idea. Then you say, you know what, I'm going to look into that and I'm going to get back to you. But make them spell out out. What's the incompatibility you see between believing in God and believing in science? Again, such a fantastic way of approaching that. That seems to be a very fruitful way of going after that. All right, so another really difficult challenge to God's existence is the problem of suffering or evil. And, you know, if you look at statistics, this is also one of those, you know, number one marquee reasons why people leave the Christian faith. And it's it's often one of those reasons, and I hear this all the time, that it's a major obstacle to be overcome. And, you know, um, I have in, in the near future uh, a few complete episodes devoted to this. I know you have had some as well on your show, but what are some ways we can at least begin to answer the question of suffering? Uh, you know, the atheist challenge, which you, as you describe it in the book, says everybody who walks into a children's hospital knows that God doesn't exist. How do you meet that challenge? Yeah, this this is a big one. And, you know, it's something everyone has to do some preparing for, some praying about, some reading. And you have to know where the person is coming from and who you're talking to before you really dive into this. But, excuse me, the first thing I would ask is, are you coming at this? If I was talking to someone about this issue and they said, you know, everybody who walks through children's hospital – knows that God doesn't exist. Just look at all the suffering. I would ask them, you know, are you coming at this like an intellectual philosophical puzzle or are you coming at this as someone who's going through some terrible suffering right now or uh, living alongside someone going through terrible suffering? Because whether someone's coming at it as like an intellectual problem or they're coming at it as like a pastoral or emotional problem, I'm going to answer differently in those scenarios. And just because like the answers we would give are different to one, it doesn't mean the other answers are bad. It just means they're not necessarily appropriate. So when someone's going through suffering, and I recommend people to read the book of Job in the Bible, but what happens is Job is going through tremendous suffering. Everything's taken from him. And then his friends show up. His friends actually do the right thing at first and they just sit with him. And, you know, that's what a good friend does. They're just be there for them and be be a good friend as he's going through that. But then once his friends start opening their mouths and start getting philosophical and theological and trying to explain things, that's when the story heads downhill. And, and Job gets angry with them. They have some terrible exchanges. But I invite you to read into that because I will say if you're talking to someone who's going through suffering, then giving these abstract cold, calculating, philosophical answers to the problem are not the best way to go about it. Just be a good friend. Be there for them. Perhaps you can lend them like a pastorally minded book at some point. Um, Making Sense of Suffering by Peter Kreeft is good. He's just very mindful uh, of all those issues. But I don't think the philosophical explanations are going to work. That doesn't mean they're bad answers. It just means if they're coming at it from a pastoral or emotional perspective, that's not where I would go. But let's say, okay, You're talking to someone and they pitch the problem. They're an atheist and they're like, you know what? I just don't think there's good reason to believe in God. And my biggest issue is this. There's evil in the world. And how is God supposed to be all good if he doesn't stop this evil? So maybe you are coming at it from an intellectual perspective. In that case, I'd still ask the person to question. 
Okay. I still think you got to ask them this nice question. I've learned this from different people, but you ask them, are they coming at this as a logical problem or an evidential problem? And what I mean by that is, do, are you claiming that it's logically impossible that God and evil can coexist? Or do you just think that God provides, or sorry, do you just think that evil provides evidence that God does not exist. Okay, so that's the dis- next distinction you have to make. Is it a logical impossibility, or are you just using this as like some evidence that God doesn't exist? Because here's the deal. If they're trying to make a logical argument that it's impossible, that if there's evil and suffering in the world, it's impossible that God exists, that's a very hard argument to show. If they make that move, it's very hard to make that logic go through. And I'll just give a few quick points that I would make uh, further and then feel free to follow up or, or we can go on to a different one. But the, if they say that they're trying to show a logical impossibility, I would point out a few things. One, I would say, hey, listen, God created a world with human beings who can freely choose good or bad things. And this gift of being able to freely choose good or bad, you know, that's a good thing. That's a great thing. However, a byproduct of that is that human beings might choose evil. And they might choose evil a lot of the time. And that accounts for a lot of the evil and suffering in our world when these human beings choose evil. Now, of course, they might realize that and they might have other uh, cases of evil in the back of their mind that don't stem from humans, things like natural disasters or diseases and so forth. So a second point I would also make is, listen, as Catholic Christians, we also believe in this horrible cosmic event known as the fall of Adam and Eve. And even if you don't take the Genesis story literally, we do believe in uh, two human parents who made a decision to separate themselves from God, which launched our creation into a cosmic chaos full of disease, natural disasters, and other things that wouldn't have affected us had we remained with God in the garden. And at that point, they might say, well, you know what, John, I don't believe any of that Adam and Eve stuff. And I'd say, okay, that's fine, but that's a different objection than saying that the problem of evil shows God doesn't exist. If you're objecting to the fact that you just don't believe in the story of the fall as a real historical event, that's fine, and you can make that objection, but just know that you're moving the goalposts here, and you're no longer making a problem of evil. So would you admit that we have answered your problem of evil at that point? And you could put this back to them if they make that. And then just the third point I would make, if they claim that it's logically impossible for God and evil to coexist, this is a really, really strong claim. And it's a lot stronger than the skeptic realizes because it amounts to the fact that God, if evil and God can't coexist, God is literally not allowed. He cannot bring about certain goods that are logically linked with evil. And Dr. Edward Fazer discusses this in his book, but things like courage, compassion, and forgiveness in the face of great evils. Those three things I just said, like imagine having courage in the face of a great evil. Imagine having compassion for someone in the face of great evil. Imagine forgiving someone who committed a grave evil. Those things literally could never be exemplified if it were not possible for God and evil to coexist. Moreover, God would not be able to manifest his justice and his mercy in a world where uh, evil and good coexist. It didn't coexist. He would only be able to do one of those. Maybe he could show his justice. Maybe he could show his mercy, but he wouldn't be able to demonstrate or manifest uh, both of those attributes. So for a few of those reasons, that's just kind of a a sketch. Uh, But I think that's why the logical impossibility is very hard to show and doesn't succeed. So what if somebody then objects to uh, suffering and God's existence on this idea of of the evidence of suffering? Do uh, Do you have a way of responding to that kind of challenge? Absolutely. So I would say a few things. And honestly, there's so much in the literature on this. So I would invite all people, do your homework, go read some different folks. People are making different points. Come up with your own outline. I've got my own outline uh, that I can mention towards the end, just some talking points I've typed up for each of the problems. But a few things I'd say, if they say, okay, you know what, you're right. It's not logically impossible, but evil is just evidence that God doesn't exist. I would say, okay, If it's evidence, though, we have to weigh the evidence on both sides. And evil is not the only evidence in this case because we also have good reasons to believe that God exists. And that's where you can bring in those arguments that we discussed earlier, Aquinas' arguments, the Kalam argument, the moral argument, other arguments, because it's not just evil and then nothing else on the other side. It's evil and then all these arguments for God's existence. Another point I'd make, we're not – here's – and this – Dr. William Lane Craig makes this all the time. 
It just so happens in our finite minds and in our finite place in the universe, we're not in position to see all the picture and weigh the results of all the evil and suffering in the world and how it affects different individuals across time. We're just not in position to see that. What we see as a terrible act of suffering in a moment, you know, 30, 40 years from now could involve, you know, the salvation of hundreds of people that we've never met. Or perhaps it, it leads to, you know, centuries later, some other event that we never could have imagined. We just can't see all of the picture. And Dr. Craig brings up the idea of the butterfly effect and chaos theory to show that just because we can't see how a piece of evil fits into God's providential plan doesn't mean that it doesn't fit into the plan in a way that God's able to draw good out of the evil. One final point I'd make, and this is a tougher point to go through and I've done a few episodes on it, and I'm just going to kind of make it really briefly now, but Father Brian Davis has written a book called The Reality of God and the Problem of Evil, where he's argued that the God of classical theism is not a human moral agent like we are. He's he's not someone that can be judged as guilty by neglect. He's not like a cosmic boy scout that improves and gets rewarded with merit badges, or he gets demerits if he does the wrong thing. No, God of classical theism is perfect in himself. He does not change. He doesn't grow in virtue or lose virtue. He doesn't make decisions with respect to um, moral duties or obligations. He's just radically different from us. So when it comes to looking at his actions in creation, they just don't fit the bill for what we would normally judge someone as being guilty by neglect. Yes, if God were like a caricature of a human being flying around up in the sky, throwing down lightning bolts, perhaps you can judge him in that way. But the God of classical theism isn't like that. So I know that's only a sketch. That's only a few bullet points, but I look forward to listening to your guests in the future and also learning about that more myself and how to make that argument better. Yeah, you know, it's one of those, um, it's one of those in- enormous issues, if not the biggest. You know, I've heard some people call it the biggest issue in in uh, you know, in Christian apologetics, at least, in convincing people of God's existence, is this enormous problem of suffering that many people can't get over. You know, I think of uh, one way that that Peter Kreeft talked about this was the idea that uh, you know God intends for the the maximal good for each one of us. You know, not not just this this good for everybody, that these evil sufferings will work out somehow for the greater good of everybody, but but actually for each each one of us, he intends that suffering we experience to work out for our individual good. And that, you know, like you like you've said, God isn't isn't like a, a genie or something that's going to uh, grant all our wishes and and we can easily see what he's thinking, what he's doing and in, in the suffering in the midst of it at least. But to know that regardless of what we can see, that, that suffering is the, the best way of, of bringing us towards a place where it is the best place for us to be, right? God is just so much bigger than we can understand, and, and His perspective is so much larger than we can understand. The suffering can't be easily explained, but it does have a purpose, I, and I think that's a that's a big point that it's you're going to have to submit to that perspective and submit to being, you know, a finite uh, person in creation before you have any hope of coming to a resolution on this problem. But I actually would I don't know if I would agree with all that you just expressed about from from Dr. Kreeft. I'm not sure if he says it in precisely those ways, but recently I've actually and through the episode with Dr. Coons, I've been exploring this more and I've, I've actually come to doubt. I don't, I'm not sure how how to phrase it as far as painting God as a maximizer of sorts of things. Like, I don't know if I want to put that on him uh, necessarily, but I will say that he is goodness itself. And his providential plan is intended to work out for the good. And this other fact that he provides all men the sufficient grace to be saved and being saved and coming to union with God is another point I would make. People think, you know, being happy in this life is the ultimate end. And, you know, he's just supposed to make a nice arena for his human pets, as Dr. Craig describes it sometimes. But I would say, no, the ultimate end is knowing and loving God and being in union with him forever. And just because someone might have a seemingly terrible life, we just read the parable of Lazarus, you know, uh, weeks ago in in mass, Uh, but someone might have a seemingly 
bad life here, but they still have the sufficient grace to be joined with God and to love and to live with him forever in eternity. So that's just another thing to factor into the situation as well, the eternal significance, not just the finite, immediate benefits here. (laughs) That's a great point. And I think it was uh, Dr. Eleanor Stump, who I know you've had on your show, who somewhere near the beginning of her enormous uh, book on suffering, which is just fantastic, I think she makes the point that if you aren't a person who believes in God and believes that we are we're destined for eternity, an, you know, an everlasting life, then suffering really doesn't make a lot of sense, and it's very hard to explain because it's not as if that suffering is going to be easily resolved in something that makes sense on this side of eternity. But you know, it's like you say, it's it's our salvation is the ultimate uh, thing we can aspire to, right? The, the best thing for us to be united with God in, in the beatific vision. So if, if you're a person that doesn't have a perspective to understand or believe in that, then, then to explain suffering becomes a lot more challenging, she would say. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Now, Dr. Stump makes a lot of great points, and I, I hope to dive into more of her work in the future. <laughs> All right. So, uh, you talk in your book about how Karl Marx called religion the opiate of the masses, and Freud called it wishful thinking. How do you respond to somebody who sees religion as a crutch or simply as wishful thinking? Yeah, I think this one's a little easier to dispel or to get rid of, but I'm just going to borrow from Alvin Plantinga in his book, Knowledge and Christian Belief. He makes a distinction between de jure objections and de facto objections to belief in God. And it sounds all fancy, but the idea is this. A de jure objection just points to some sort of flaw or defect in the belief, such as it's a crutch, it's the opening of the masses, it's wishful thinking. But it doesn't actually show that the belief is false. Whereas a de facto objection, something like the problem of evil we were just discussing, aims to show that the belief is false. So what Plantinga masterfully shows is that that there's no de jure objection that succeeds independently of a de facto objection. Here's what I mean. Say the atheist says, you know, religion is just wishful thinking or a crutch that, you know, and that's how he labels it. And he says, therefore, there's an issue with Christian belief. It's wishful thinking or it's a crutch. But that issue evaporates if God exists and Christian belief is true. In other words, suppose God exists and just created beings who should wish for him or who should long for him because this world is not their ultimate home. Suppose that's the truth. Well, then, of course, wishful thinking is not counting against Christian belief, but it's actually explained by Christian belief. Similarly, take the idea that religion is just a crutch. Well, Crutches are useful if you're injured, and suppose we need that crutch to repair our brokenness and sinfulness, and everyone has their flaws, everyone's got their sins, and Christian belief might just be the crutch that we need to successfully navigate the world. So, in other words, just pointing to those supposed flaws, unless they also have a de facto objection, you know, that you know, evil shows God doesn't exist, or there's no evidence for God, unless they have some other objection in their back pocket to show that belief in God is false, none of these objections go through. (laughs) Well, that's a fantastic point. And I guess the next thing you do then is once you make that point would be then to provide some of that uh, evidence or some of those proofs to show why you believe that God does exist. And then that wishful thinking or crutch would be uh, a a benefit or, or a positive thing of that God's existence. Absolutely. So I got one more question for you here, and this is uh, this is a fun one because you've you've given us a lot to think about in answering some of these objections, and um, your your podcast dives deep into a lot of these subjects. You've listened to a lot of uh, fantastic speakers speak about these things. You've done your own studying and thinking on these topics, and I want to turn the tables on you for a second here. And what's the What's the best proof or your favorite proof that you've heard for God's existence and why do you like it so much? Yeah, that's a great question. Great question to end on. It definitely changes over time, I will say, when I study different arguments. Currently, I'd have to say I do really like Edward Fazer's Aristotelian proof for an unactualized actualizer and his rationalist proof for an absolutely necessary being. So I would pick those two as my favorite so far. He expounds on them in five proofs of the existence of God. And I think what he really does a nice time of showing is – 
not only how the premises are true, but how it logically leads to a being that possesses the divine attributes. And I think he does that really well. So I put those at the top of my list. I know I'm not picking one, but then also I'm kind of partial. These three kind of go together. I really like Dr. Robert Delfino's version of Aquinas's third way. And he did it on my podcast a little bit back. And you start just by noticing that there's some things that go into being and go out of being. And we call those possible beings. And then you you reason through a few extra premises back to the fact that there must be a necessary being and that eventually there must be one being that's necessary through itself and that he calls this uh, ipsum esse or being itself, which he, you know, he has a few more arguments to present towards that. I would say those three, like those metaphysical demonstrations, those are currently my top favorite for, I think those are the most successful. They s- securely show that God exists and has these divine attributes. But let me just give one caveat, honorable mention, I wouldn't necessarily present those in conversation first. So my favorite to present in conversation is someone who says there's no evidence for God is the Kalam cosmological argument, because it's very easy to memorize the premises. I don't think it goes as far as the metaphysical demonstrations, but I think it succeeds to show that God is the best explanation of the beginning of the universe. And it just goes very simply. Everything that begins to exist has a cause, The universe has a cause, therefore, I'm sorry, the universe began to exist, therefore, the universe has a cause. And if you could just memorize those three premises, I'll say them again. Everything that begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, therefore, the universe has a cause. And then you talk about what that cause must be. If it's the cause of the universe, it's got to be independent of space, time, matter, and energy. And it's also, um, Dr. Craig puts forth various arguments to show that the cause is plausibly personal to show that it made a choice to bring the world into being. Otherwise, it's inexplicable why the world wouldn't always exist. And the kicker is this is well supported by the current scientific consensus, which says that the universe began to exist. We got Alexander Vilenkin, who says it probably did. He said there's no viable models of a universe that didn't do that. So it's well supported. And I would say check out my interviews with Brandon Vaught and Robert Coons for more defenses of the Kalam argument. But that's a little – I know I gave you multiple arguments there, but those are some of my favorites at the moment. <laughs> hey, and a good, apolog- a good apologist can't just pick one, right? <laughs> I'll link to all of those in the show notes, those episodes and those resources for sure. Um your podcast is the Classical Theism Podcast. It's pretty easy to find, but where else can people go to find out more about what you're up to and to follow your work? Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's really been a lot of fun, Keith. And they can go to classicaltheism.com. Um, that's the main website where you can find out all the things we're up to. And I'm just going to give one special link, classicaltheism.com slash talking points. That's where I got a bunch of few uh, free PDFs of information that I've synthesized about the problem of evil, the problem of divine hiddenness, classical theism. What is classical theism? And why should we hold to it? You can find all of that there over at classicaltheism.com slash talking points. And I just want to underscore as well, it's, your website is just a fantastic resource. I mean, you've done such a good job in interviewing these people and uh, collecting all this information and putting it in one place that really, I think, truly equips somebody to talk about these things or somebody who is maybe on the atheist or agnostic or naturalist materialist side to, you know, or they could even go to your site and 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 check out some of the soundness of these arguments as well. Absolutely, and I hope they do, and I hope they keep listening to the Cordial Catholic Podcast. I know I will. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure having you in the podcast. Thanks so much. Uh, God bless you. God bless your family, and God bless the fantastic work you are doing for the church. Thanks so much, John. Thanks, Keith. God bless. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Cordial Catholic Podcast. Make sure to check out John's podcast, the Classical Theism Podcast, for a deep dive into those fantastic subjects. After hearing him on this show, I think you're convinced that you'd love his show too. Check it out. Visit thecordialcatholic.com for show notes on this show and blog articles I've written lately. There's a number of fantastic ones there, including lots of atheist conversations and challenges and similar topics to this episode, too. I'm at Cordial Catholic on Twitter, The Cordial Catholic on Facebook, and send your emails to cordialcatholic at gmail.com. <laughs>
I appreciate all those emails. They help to push this show to new boundaries and help me to continue to improve what I am doing here. Make sure to subscribe to or follow this podcast wherever you find it. Please leave ratings and reviews as well. Those help to push the podcast out to new people, and I really appreciate those. I thank you for listening. Thank you for your prayers, your fasting for the show. If you want to financially support this show as well, even $1 or $2 a month, uh, less than a cup of coffee, go to patreon.com slash cordialcatholic. $8 or more a month, and I can send you a copy of Jimmy Aiken's fantastic new book, The Bible is a Catholic Book. That's at patreon.com slash cordialcatholic. But hey, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Please tell your family, tell your friends, and keep on listening. See you next week, and God bless.